I was coming into this world from a very loving, blissful, accepting place and into this dense, dark, cold world as I was taking on all of my mother's beliefs and all of her her suppressed emotions and her traumas. And so I didn't want to go. So did you feel like you were forced to come in or did you feel like you chose to do this and then you were just having second thoughts at the end? I'm here today with Christine Bergstrom, and she is a clinical hypnotherapist, breathwork facilitator, hypnosis instructor, and podcaster who had an intense spiritual awakening. Welcome, Christine. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you so much, Melissa. I am really honored to be here. I'm a big fan of the work you're doing, so it's truly my pleasure. Likewise. So why don't we start by having you share your story of your spiritual awakening and any information that you feel is relevant to that story. Okay, great. So I'm going to kind of back up all the way to childhood because that is a big part of my story. So basically I came into this world as a very, very sensitive soul, uh, an empath. Of course, I didn't know it back then, but I really was so super sensitive and I took on the emotions and beliefs of everyone around me, specifically mom and you know my close family members. And I just remember as a child having this deep sadness. You know, you think of kids and playfulness and joy and experimentation and fun. And for some reason, that element was missing for me. And that's kind of a a piece that we'll talk about later. But I just remember feeling this deep emptiness and this feeling like something was missing, but I didn't know what that something was. So coupled, all of that coupled with the fact that I grew up in an alcoholic home was the rest uh, recipe for disaster. Now, one perspective, I could say it was a disaster. Another perspective, which is what I lean towards today is that it couldn't have happened any other way. And I'm grateful for all the experiences, but there, there was a lot of personal inner turmoil in growing up in a household like that. And so I made my way along through life feeling, you know, like an outsider, like I didn't belong even in school. I was, you know, always very, you know, uh, good at school, got good grades, did what I was supposed to do, said what I was supposed to do, tried to just stay inside the lines and be very quiet to not stir and make a mess. Well, fast forward into my teenage years. All of that suppressed emotion and that trying to fit into a box, not even knowing what box I was supposed to fit in, started to come out. And I started to have anger and all of these emotions that needed to come out. And so they were coming out at anyone and anything that crossed my path. I was very reactive and I started experimenting with drugs and you know, I know a lot of teenagers do nothing too crazy, but fast forward into my early twenties, I got into a car accident and I was prescribed some pretty heavy painkillers and fast forward six months down the road, I became addicted to them. And so from that point on for the next two years, I was in a downward spiral of despair. I was literally sinking down into that hole that had been present my whole life. And, you know, it was never about the drugs. It just happened to be the thing that I found at that time that was, I was using to fill this void. Obviously we know how that ends. So I, you know, I hit rock bottom and I had to come to a point where I needed to change something. So I got some help. I went into treatment and I started to really turn my life around. I did have a spiritual experience while I was going through treatment, although I didn't really understand it. I had no frame of reference, but I'll just kind of dive into what that is. Um, I was kind of awoken from a state of, you know, deep sleep. 
And I was filled with this love of God that is indescribable, right? We, you know, hear this often, there are no words to describe it, but it was just total love and acceptance and just bliss, ecstasy. I was just filled up and my whole field of vision was this bright white light. And it was incredible. I almost felt like I couldn't contain all of this. And it lasted for a few minutes. And then that was quickly followed up with the most terrifying feeling you could ever imagine. It literally felt like there was a demon trying to suck my soul out of me. And I was trying to bring myself out of this state by gasping or screaming, but nothing would come out. And I I thought, you know, I'm dying. This is just, it's stealing my life. And eventually someone heard me uh, stirring and they woke me up. I had no idea what that was. I was shaken up for a few days, but I really had no awareness of spirituality or um, you know, any frame of reference. So I, I just continued to go along my merry way, cleaning up my life, putting all the pieces back together. And so that is what I did. And eventually I created a, a beautiful life. And on paper, you know, a couple years later, it, it looked like I should be so happy and so fulfilled. I had a beautiful marriage, three beautiful kids. I just purchased a house. I had a, you know, a decent job. And yet I had this hole in my soul is what I can describe it as a feeling of emptiness, a feeling like something is missing. And I didn't have the drugs anymore to fill that void. And so I started going on um, this mission to figure out what this was all about and what I was supposed to be doing with my life. So at first I thought I wanted to be a a counselor or maybe an addiction counselor. So I decided I was going to go back to school and start that journey of uh, just exploration and learning and, you know, doing all the things that I never gave myself a chance to do when I was younger. So I went back to college and, you know, eventually just nothing was feeling right. But I um, had a conversation with an acquaintance who had went to hypnotherapy school and I just started picking her brain about it. And so she told me, you know, if you're going to go, I I only recommend you go to this one school. It's the best of the best. And before I knew it, I had signed up. So I was going on a completely new adventure. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. It was like I was led there. And I really do believe that's the truth. And so I started going through the training. When you go through the training, you really have to go through the whole process yourself as as a client, the same kind of processes that you take your clients through. And so there's a series of different types of sessions that are basically peeling away at the layers, eventually working to heal our issues at a root cause level. And I knew how important that was. And I had the realization while I was doing this that although I had done some work uh, on myself and, and healing what had happened in my life, I very much had not healed my issue at that root cause level. The same one that I was using, you know, uh, stuffing and, and trying to fill that void. So that is what ended up happening during my training. So I'll share a little bit later about exactly what um, this process is, but it's not hypnosis. It's something called breath work, and it's not yogic breath work or relaxation type. It's a very uh, deep style of conscious breathing, and it's intended to bring whatever is unhealed to the, the conscious awareness from the subconscious, and it does it in a really, really powerful way. And so I was there in my training and it was my turn to get in the chair and to do this process of breath work. And you know what? I was so sick and tired of feeling how I was feeling that I was willing to do anything at that point to feel better. If you would have told me to walk through fire, I would have done it. And so I put my whole heart and soul into that session and I had the most amazing life-changing experience that I I can't even think about it without getting chills right now. What happened was I re-experienced my birth and not the physicality of going through the birth canal and coming into this world, but it was the incarnation of my soul. And so what happened was um, 
all of a sudden I'm breathing and all these emotions are coming up. And all of a sudden I start saying, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. I don't want to go. And my facilitator, you have to remember, she was a student at the time. She, I could, you know, I knew she was kind of freaking out. Like, you don't want to go where, what do, what do I do with this? But what was happening was I was coming into this world from a very loving, blissful, accepting place and into this dense, dark, cold world. And what happened was, is I was taking on all of my mother's beliefs and all of her her suppressed emotions and her traumas. And so I didn't want to go. And so in that session, I actually had a conversation with God and my guides and a new understanding of why I was coming into this world and also a reframing of these beliefs that I had come to believe about myself, like unworthiness or not being lovable or not being good enough. And in that session, all of those limiting beliefs were healed. And I also healed that relationship with my mother, which you know, was a a big part of this journey. And so after that session, I ended up calling my mom crying, you know, saying, you know, I had this most, the most incredible session. And I told her about the whole thing. And the really interesting thing was that uh, it lined up with how I actually came into this world as far as the birth. Um, She said she was in labor and then all of a sudden she got to the hospital and it was like, boom, I was there. Well, that's because I was literally being kicked here. So they were like, you agreed to come. It's time to go. And they gave me the boot is is kind of what happened. But um, what happened after that session for the next three weeks, I was literally living in a different dimension. I believe that session awoken my kundalini energy, I guess, if you want to describe it like that. It opened my third eye. It unblocked all of my energy centers. And I was experiencing life like we are supposed to experience here in this world, embodying and knowing the true essence of who we are as spiritual beings. And it also opened up all these gifts um, that later quieted down some, but uh, Claire audience and um clairvoyance and I was seeing spirits. It was all a little bit too much for a while, honestly, but I was experiencing such love and bliss and just total acceptance for what I had been through and forgiveness. And that lasted for about three weeks. And then I started to ground down and come back into this reality. And so that was the really profound spiritual experience that kind of put me on this path. I've had a lot of mystical experiences since then, but it's been, it's been an incredible journey. And now I get to facilitate this work with clients and help them heal what needs to be healed within their own subconscious. So that is my story. Christine, thank you so much for sharing your story. What a powerful experience. Do you mind if I ask you a few questions about those experiences? Sure, go ahead. Okay, so the first sort of mystical experience that you mentioned is that you had this like really blissful experience of the light followed by a really terrible experience. Um, Do you have any insights into what those two extremes were and why you experienced them? Yeah, I've thought a lot about it, and I don't think I could have fully understood it back then. Doing this work and having had have seen this with clients, um, there is this phenomenon that is it's scary to talk about and think about, but they are entities. And, um, you know, we live in a world full of a universe full of different types of energies. Some of them are polarized good and some are not so good. And when someone is in the thick of an addiction or alcoholism or in a deep depression, they're an energetic match for these lower vibrational beings. So I think because I was healing, I had set the intention to really get better and to, you know, completely change my life around. It was threatening perhaps an entity that had maybe I I had picked up And uh, I think it was also God showing me like, this is who you are and this is what's available. 
and perhaps it, it was a release of an entity. I don't really understand it fully, but I do think it would it has something to do with a lower vibrational being. Wow, that's fascinating. So you said that you've helped other people, like, or you've come across this in your work. So do you have any advice for people who may be dealing with some kind of a negative entity? Although I don't really like that word negative because yeah. language is limiting, but you know what I mean. Yes. And I, what I would say is from my experience, at least, is that the people who actually have these attachments have no idea. The people who are wondering, do I have an entity? Usually they're they're not the ones. Um, there are some telltale signs like um, a feeling of being stuck or depressed, sometimes dark circles under the eyes. Or if you do have an addiction or alcoholism, then it, you are very susceptible to uh, taking on these beings. You actually create um, holes in your aura and they can get in that way. But there's really nothing to be afraid of. You know, I almost don't like talking about these because it can instill so much fear. Mm -hmm. But the fear is actually the thing that they feed on. Um, I had a client that uh, came in for he was just feeling kind of stuck on his path and we get to his second session and uh, it's a session called parts therapy where we explore different parts of us that are unhealed. And so we're connecting with this part of him and all of a sudden this entity comes forward and starts speaking. He had no idea what entities were. Uh, he had no awareness of this, but it was very obvious that it wasn't of his own consciousness. Now, some people, there are different ways to look at entities. Some people uh, think, or and they could be um, souls that have um, you know, deceased. They have passed on from this realm, but they, they don't for whatever, get the message, or they don't think that they're going to go to heaven. Maybe they think they're going to go to hell. So they don't cross over. They don't go, go into the light. So they get stuck in this realm. And the only way they can survive is if they have an energy source. Um, then there's the idea of thought forms. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of that concept, but when yeah. you feed a negative thought over and over again, it becomes kind of its own entity. Um, and a lot, I think a lot of these entities just have no idea that they're supposed to be somewhere else. So you can actually help them cross over. But, you know, I do think it's probably something you would want to get help with if you really honestly think that you have one and there are different techniques to help release these energies, but just having the intention of, um, cleansing your system from anything that's not yours and really claiming your sovereignty and raising your personal vibration so that there is no match anymore. It it can't sustain. I was going to bring up that point about sovereignty because as you were talking, I was just, I was kind of having like a gut feeling maybe that, that people like myself who who tend to be like a people pleaser. I always like such a people pleaser, have a really hard time with conflict, have a really hard time with boundaries. And these are things that I'm having to learn now as an adult, but it makes me wonder if maybe those boundaries, that lack of boundaries could also translate into lack of spiritual boundaries. And I could have been more receptive to entities to come in and feed on my energy because I've always struggled with like, as a child, I was severely depressed and I've had on and off struggles with anxiety and things like that. Absolutely. I think that can be a factor of the boundaries. And I experienced the exact same thing. I didn't know where my emotions ended and another one started. So I do think that plays, um, you know, a piece, but really, if you are focusing on healing yourself and, and reclaiming your sovereignty and, you know, doing the deep work, it's, it's going to happen naturally that that was a very extreme situation. And, um, you know, I don't see them too often, but, but it is a, a thing that, uh, actually exists. 
Well, thank you for sharing. I would love to ask you about um, the experience you had during the breath work, which almost sounds like a pre-birth memory or a birth memory. Mm-hmm. Um, was that, how, how much detail was there with that? Did, did you see like a physical location where you were when you were agreeing to live this life? Or was it more of just like um, an experience of the birth process? It was more an experience of feeling rather than Mm -hmm. seeing. Um, I myself tend to be a more kinesthetic person. I feel more rather than having, you know, these, these detailed visions in my mind. So I don't know if that played into it, but I just, you know, when it, so how this process works, your emotions will come to a peak And then um, the root cause of them will be revealed. And so I was just kicking and screaming, basically saying, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. I don't want to go. And feeling this this, um, dynamic of this beautiful, accepting, loving space and the density and the despair uh, with all of my mother's own emotions and her beliefs and in, in people, I think we often don't realize that babies take on the emotions of mom, even in the womb. And so me being an empathic soul, of course, I was doing that from the very get go. So I didn't want to go there. And, you know, I had to be reminded that you decided to do this. You can do this. These aren't your emotions. These aren't your beliefs. You are loved. You are worthy. This is what you signed up for. But it was a very, um, it was a visceral experience, but it was more of a a feeling rather than a seeing. Mm. So did you feel like you were forced to come in or did you like feel like you chose to do this and then you were just having second thoughts at the end? Yes, definitely the latter. Um, and I, I have to kind of believe that that's probably what happens with a lot of us. It's mm-hmm. like we get presented the opportunity and it's, oh, yeah, I can do that. And that's great. And I'll overcome that and it'll be wonderful. And then in the process, when we start feeling that contrast, it's really, really scary. And we might want to change our minds. Now, could some change their mind and be, you know, accepted back on the other side and not have to do it. I'm certain that happens sometimes. But for me, I was literally given the spiritual boot and said, nope, you, you agreed to this. You're going. (laughs) All right. So let's move on. And I would love to hear about the breathwork practice that you teach. Yeah. So, um, what it's based on. So let me just kind of back up and say, I went through hypnotherapy training. I feel very blessed that we, we also learned a different type of modality in that training called breath work. Um, they're both very similar in the way of the ultimate goal is to get to the root cause of our problems. So most people think of hypnosis and they think, Uh, I'm just going to reprogram your mind or reprogram your limiting beliefs. And that's a part of it. But ultimately, we work to heal the issue at a root cause level. And so instead of a facilitator putting someone into hypnosis and going to the root cause, we use the breath to do it in a breathwork session. So um, it is very different than, you know, yogic or relaxation type of breathing. There's many different styles of breath work. Um, It's like trending right now. And I'm seeing all different kinds of teachings come out. They're all a little bit different and they may have different intentions, but this is a very deep style of conscious breathing where we flood the body with life force energy, with oxygen. Now, why this is so powerful, it's because our emotions are intimately connected with our breath. So we as human beings in uh, moments of overwhelm or stress or uh, trauma, we tend to hold our breath, even in a, like a minorly stressful moment, we, we hold our breath or we breathe very shallow. And what happens is we don't know we're doing this, but we're trying to stop feeling because this out here is too much. So 
just going to kind of hold my breath and that's going to stop the feeling process. But when we do that, we stop the flow of emotions, which are energies in motion, emotion. Um, Emotions are meant to move through us and they're temporary energies. Even science says that um, the chemical expression of an emotion only lasts 90 seconds but we don't do this. And we're not taught this. I wasn't taught this in the eighties. In fact, I was taught the opposite. Don't show your emotions. Don't cry. And so I had stuffed and stuffed and stuffed and stuffed and stuffed. And so in this process of breathing, it starts to uh, release these suppressed emotions in a really powerful way. It's a very physical and visceral process, but it's so incredibly powerful because you're literally releasing these energies. And then um, when it gets to a peak, whatever needs to be healed in the subconscious, and it's very much based on the intention that you set at the beginning, if you set the intention to go to the root cause of your anxiety or your stress, the root cause of that will come into the conscious awareness. And then you can work through it and process with a really powerful protocol to heal that aspect of us that's kind of frozen in time, seeing the world through our eyes. Um, The most important time in our lives as humans is between birth and the age of seven, when you could say we're in a state of hypnosis, our... um, we're in a different brain brainwave state as children. We're in the primarily a theta brainwave state, which you could say is a state of hypnosis. And while this is a beautiful thing, it uh, leads us to be creative and uninhibited and expressive and all those beautiful things. It also means we are literally being programmed in that time. We're being programmed by everything and everyone in our experience, mom, dad, society, religion, school, Uh, media, everything. And we're concluding beliefs about ourselves, the world, and everyone in it. Most of us take those belief systems from zero to seven, and we go out and we live our entire lives based on those beliefs. And so if I believe I'm unworthy, I'm going to show up in the world with that belief projected into my reality and create experiences and attract people and situations that reflect that unworthiness back to me. Our subconscious works to make our beliefs come true. It works to say, you believe you're unworthy? Okay, I'll show you. And so we get stuck in this loop of of believing, projecting unconsciously, attracting and creating. And so I think this is why, you know, when I'd gone to school and learned about regular psychology and counseling, it felt like there was something missing because you're only dealing with the 5% of our mind, which is our conscious mind. But this style of breath work and hypnotherapy really work to get in contact with that 95%, which is really driving all of our behaviors, emotions, reactions. I don't know if I answered your question, but. Yes, you did. That's fascinating to me. Obviously I'm not a mental health professional or anything like that, but I saw a therapist for a while because of issues that I was dealing with after my deconstruction. And I remember them talking about this, about um, how there's certain modalities that will actually get to the subconscious mind, like EMDR or Mm -hmm. somatic, I, I don't know, but something to do with like things that reconnect you to your body. And it almost sounds like this could be a similar thing, like with the breath bringing you back into your body and accessing the subconscious mind. Yeah, absolutely. It's a really, really powerful process. And for me, I think why um, it worked so well, I tend to be a very analytical person. So even in hypnosis, I'm sitting there thinking, am I doing this right? Is this really working? Like, (laughs) you know, all that mental chatter, but in breath work, it kind of gives you no choice, but to get out of your own way. And you feel it physically because after that first session, I literally felt like I had dropped a hundred pound backpack of stuff I had been been carrying around my whole life. So it it is very much a physical process. That's amazing. So could I ask you, Um, In your work doing this with people, what are some of the most common limiting beliefs that people have? 
So a really common one is unworthiness or feeling like they're not good enough. And I do want to stop and say that our parents, most of them were the the most uh, well-intending of people. They just came in from their own programming, their own upbringing, um, and unknowingly passed all that stuff on to us. So I, you know, I have a great relationship with my mom now and she's done her own, you know, work and process. I lead her through breathwork sessions now. So it's pretty amazing, but feeling unworthiness, not good enough, unlovable, unwanted, those seem to be a staple. And I think I think more than even our upbringing, it's a part of the human experience because we know that we're not from here on some level. Even the most unconscious person feels a disconnect. And like that hole I was talking about before, that was missing the place and the connection that I'm from. I was thinking about that too, because it seems like no matter how good of parents people have and like how healthy I should say would be a better word than good, but healthy relationship with your parents. Um, it still seems like most people have a lot of trauma that they have to work through. And I was wondering if maybe some of that is because of society, um, like how much of it do you think is could be attributed to society and how much influence do you think parents have over their kids versus society? I think it's all of that and more. And even if you uh, believe in past lives, you could be carrying a lot of these beliefs mm. over because they are unresolved. Um, so I do believe it's a little bit of all of that. Even if you were to take the model of what you perceive as to be the perfect parents, they're still going to screw their kids up somehow. So sometimes the things that come up in these sessions are things that the client may have never thought twice about. It's really interesting what can be imprinted in our subconscious and make us feel a certain way. Um, and then buried, for instance, a two-year-old, uh, say a toddler is just learning how to walk and they may stumble or bump their head and fall and they start crying for mom. Mom's in the kitchen. She's trying to get dinner on the table so she doesn't come right over. Maybe she takes five minutes to come over. In that five minutes, the baby is crying, you know, crying out for comfort and love and mom doesn't come right away. So in that moment, even though we didn't have the language back then, it's more about the feelings of I'm not important. I'm not loved. So, you know, going through this journey, I really, you know, started to feel guilty about my own parenting. And even now I still, is that the right thing? Did I, but I, we can't do that. We do our best. And um, if we're present and loving to our children and talk about it, I think that that's more than enough. It, it's just the it's just the experience, I think, something that is a part of this awakening journey. Wow, that's so interesting. Um, and so do you think it's almost like it's just part of the human experience that we're going to experience situations that cause us to form limiting beliefs. Yes. So do you think that it is possible if we continue down this path of healing that we're on now, because with all of this information that we have available, I feel like this generation is really diving in and, and working on healing themselves, healing their traumas and becoming a more um, emotionally balanced and healthy do you think it's possible that at some point in the future, a week as society could actually create a healthy society, um, healthy society where we're not constantly just um, coming in, getting programmed with limiting beliefs and then growing up to do damage control and then doing it all over again? Yes, yes, yes. I love that question. I think that's where we're headed. And I think that's what's happening right now. It's such an exciting time. I, again, I'm getting goosebumps just talking about it because I believe that this is it. This is what we came for. Mm -hmm. We came for this great awakening that's happening. You know, this, these stories, uh, people just have such a thirst for it because I think it sparks that remembrance in us all. 
And yes, we are healing on a collective level right now. It, that is my belief. So just as in these individual journeys, our biggest traumas need to come up to the surface to be processed, to heal, to move into a new way of being. That's what's happening at a collective level now. I mean, we can look around in these last few years and see all kinds of wild things happening. And some people perceive this as, you know, the end of times or the darkest hour, but that may be true. But what is on the other side of that? I believe it's what I came here for, at least, is to witness and be a part of that, because I think we are moving into an era where we're not going to have to do this anymore. We're going to come in differently as souls. We're going to embody our truth more and really create a whole new experience. Wow. Okay, so I should have asked you this before, but do you remember what your purpose was in coming here? I don't think that was ever revealed to me during that spiritual experience. I've had kind of a lot of other little, I call them little, but compared to that mystical experiences along the way where I've been given glimpses of uh, what my purpose here in this life is. But I think even though we all may have a different flavor of that, um, or something that we're really meant to do in this life. I think more than anything, we came here to experience. And, you know, when we think about emotions, like I was talking about before, the emotions we experience here are not the same on the other side. So it is an experience to have sadness and despair and struggle and, and feeling like that there's a hole in your heart. It's an experience. So I believe I came here to have an, a human experience, but to also in that experience, awaken to the truth of who I am as a spiritual being. So I, I don't know other than to experience, to love and to remember. Are, are there any other mystical experiences that you've had that you would like to share? Well, there's a lot. Um, some of them didn't have a lot of substance to them, but they were just odd. So one of the first times I had a, uh, an interaction with interdimensional beings, I guess you could say, uh, I woke up in the middle of the night and next to my bed was about this 10 or 11 foot tall being wearing a robe, a long purple robe. And the face didn't really have any features. Uh, I couldn't make out any features in the face, but I felt a loving presence. So looking at the being, you would have been scared, but the presence I felt was a loving one. And so, um, and then at the foot of my bed though, interestingly enough, I saw two shadow beings. So at the same time, I had this tall robed intergalactic being and these two shadow beings in my room. Um, I've had a lot of experiences like that where maybe there wasn't any communication or understanding of who or what they were, but um, I, I've had also clear audience experiences. Um, interestingly enough, before I had that huge spiritual experience, and this is how I know everything is, is unfolding perfectly, and there was a higher part of me that was orchestrating everything. I actually had an experience one night where I was woken up and um, I was hearing someone speaking to me in my right ear, clear as day, like they were sitting next to me, speaking into my ear. And she was telling me about the power of Jesus Christ and, and how I should believe in him. And he is all loving and he, you know, is all forgiving. And just the, she went on and on and on about the power of Jesus. I wasn't into religion. I wasn't into Jesus. I'm still not religious, but that experience kind of shook me up, first of all, because I hadn't even been introduced into these deeper spiritual concepts or even the idea of Claire audience. Um, but one of the most profound experiences was I was woken up in the middle of the night. So I was in a deep sleep and then I became lucid. Um, totally aware. My eyes were closed, but I was totally aware and present. And all of a sudden I knew I was surrounded by a team of angels, 
all these beings, they were so beautiful and so loving and they were holding me and there was this beautiful music and all these beautiful colors, magical, mystical, being held in the most uh, intense, loving bliss that you could ever imagine. And then there was no communication as in words, but it was somehow communicated to me that they were going to teach me how to raise my vibrational state. And so they started again, there, there was no actual conversation, but it was like this transmission of energy that they had me begin to start to rev up my energy. Like if you can imagine you are stepping on the, the gas pedal and you're revving up your car, it was more of an intentional revving up of your energy. And at the same time, repeating in my mind, like a mantra, the kingdom of heaven is within me. The kingdom of heaven is within me. And this went on and on. I was revving my energy up and repeating this mantra over and over again. And I just kept raising the vibrational ladder until it felt like I couldn't contain it anymore. And I just blissed out there for, I have no idea how long, but it it was an incredible experience and like an actual tool that I was given. It was, it was really wild. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. That is fascinating. So are you still able to use that tool now to raise your vibration? Nowhere near like I experienced <laughs> that that time because I was they were helping to create that experience, obviously. But I have used it in those words, the kingdom of heaven is within me. They just they mean so much and it it feels true. It feels like home. So that's been a big part of my path. Wow. Well, let's close out by talking a little bit more about the breath work. So I would love to hear, first of all, if you can share, and if not, I understand, but if you're able to share, I would love to hear more about the technique that you use. Sure. So again, this is a very um, deep style of conscious breathing. There's been many different um, labels that have been, I guess, different trademarks of breath work that have been developed throughout the years. Um, there was a type of breath work or is, I should say called rebirthing that was created, I believe in the fifties or sixties, but, uh, they called it rebirthing because people often experience their birth. And so that is what happened to me, but it's ba- basically a deep style of conscious breathing through the mouth. So not through the nose at all. So just sidebar When you breathe through your nose, that signals the parasympathetic nervous system, which calms and relaxes you. Breathing through the mouth does the opposite. So if you're trying to calm down in a moment moment of overwhelm, close your mouth and breathe through your nose and breathe deep into your diaphragm. But this particular breathing is done through the mouth and it's a wide mouth. So you're getting as much oxygen in and out of your system. And you're basically just breathing like that like this. Okay. Um, I usually take clients through a trial run before we officially start and they do it for about 30 seconds. They go, there's no way I'm going to be able to do this for 40, 50 minutes. And I say, yes, there is, you can do it. Um, the mind doesn't want us to do anything that's, uh, outside of the realm of normal or that's deemed unsafe or risky. So the mind can be very active in the beginning, But basically, there's kind of an unfolding of a typical breathwork session. So the client is breathing in that particular way. Um, In the beginning stages, there may be a lot of mental chatter or the mind trying to stop you from doing the process. Um, And then that kind of dissipates. And then the client may feel some physical sensations, all kinds of really wild sensations that wouldn't be normal outside of breathwork. Um, Some of those sensations are tingling. Um, a feeling of even numbness, uh, cramping sensations. Um, it It is my belief, I'm sure there's a scientific explanation that definitely has to do with the CO2 levels in the blood, but there are literally energies that are moving within your body. So I, the advice I give is to not resist whatever's coming up, whether that's a thought or a physical sensation or an emotion to just lean into it and breathe into it. 
And then the next phase is the emotional. So it usually happens in that order, the mental phase of the mind being very active. And then the physical body starts to feel some sensations and then the emotions start to come up. And that's the whole reason that we do this practice. And then when the emotions are at a peak, we can use them to bridge back to the very first time that you felt that way, because everything we've ever felt in this lifetime, it's not the first time we felt that way. And sometimes we have an accumulation of that same feeling. And so it's just getting compiled with all of these different experiences, but this will take us back to the very first time. And then once that comes into the conscious awareness, we return the breathing to normal and we process it in the whole reason we're doing this. It's not to relive trauma or any or blame or anything like that. It's really all about forgiveness, forgiveness of self, forgiveness of others, and liberating an aspect of you that's still living out that trauma. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I'm wondering if this is safe for people to try on their own because someone might be watching and then thinking of trying it. And so I want to make sure I, I give you the chance to say if, if it's unsafe to do on your own and if they should have guidance while doing it. Yes. Thank you so much for bringing that up because I would not recommend doing this on your own. You probably wouldn't be able to do it on your own, to be honest, because it can get very challenging and you really do. I personally need someone to lovingly coach me and push me along. Um, but I do know there are, um, there's even YouTube videos out there now of these breathwork journeys. Um, also, I, I do want to mention that some of the breathwork practices out there aren't necessarily even about healing these root cause issues. It's just about breathing and feeling and releasing maybe on a musical journey. Those are absolutely incredible. You might want to try that. Um, you know, if you're trying to dip your toes into this practice, uh, holotropic breath work there, I know there are some videos on YouTube, um, where you can take this inner journey into the subconscious using your breath, uh, listening to music and the intention is different. We're not going in to heal a trauma, although be aware that something can pop up into your conscious awareness that hasn't been healed. So it, it is always best to seek um, the guidance of a professional, someone who's experienced in doing this. Um, and then, of course, there are some contraindications to the style of breath work. So if you have like unmanaged high blood pressure or brain injuries or schizophrenic or bipolar, even that's a little um, could be uh, argued because some people think that this can actually cure some of that stuff. So it is best to just get educated and really explore the idea and see if it's right for you. But I think for the most part, this style of breathing can really help most people in an incredible way. Well, thank you so much for sharing and thank you for offering the other options for people because that was going to be my next question was to ask if somebody was wanting to get into breath work, um, what types of breath work would you recommend? Yeah, again, there are, it is uh, one of the fastest growing, um, I guess you could say wellness modalities that that's trending right now is breath work. And there are so many different variations. There's uh, different e techniques, even like a two part inhale and a one part exhale. Wim Hof, I'm sure you guys have heard of yes. Wim Hof, the Iceman. Um, they all are a little bit different and they may have different intentions. So this process that I've shared, it really is coupled with the processing that hypnotherapy offers. So we're not just bringing this stuff up into the conscious awareness and then, you know, breathing through it and hoping it releases. We're really working with that inner child to reframe those beliefs. But I 
you know, I encourage you, if you are curious about breathwork, explore it all, try it all. You can even, Wim Hof, I believe, has an app where you can do a little 10 minute breathwork session because this breath really does help you access higher states of awareness. Uh, it allows you to access your subconscious to clear these emotional blocks. They're actually finding out that it's really healing to the physical body. Wim Hof is doing a lot of scientific research um, on how it's creating um, an alkaline environment within the body, which disease cannot thrive in that environment. And so there are stories of people healing themselves from autoimmune disorders and all kinds of illnesses. But again, there these modalities or these um, styles are all a little bit different with different intentions. But I highly, highly encourage you to explore the power of the breath and not just in these deep practices, but in every moment. Our breath is our life force energy. It is our connection to the true essence of who we are and to God. And it brings us to the now moment. So I've explored all different types of breathwork modalities and different ways we can utilize the breath for different um, you know, ailments we may have, even panic and anxiety, the breath can bring you back in such an incredible way. Christine, I'd like to give you a chance to share with the viewers where they can find you. Sure. So you can find me. Well, I do have a podcast here on YouTube that's separate from all of this I've talked about. I have an obsession with near-death experiencers and um, spiritually transformative experiences. And I interview those much like Melissa. It's called the North Star Broadcast, and it's here on YouTube. Um, but I also, you know, do work with clients one on one every day. That's my day job. Um, and so you can find me at christinebhypnotherapy.com. And yeah, I'd love to hear your questions or offer any insight or wisdom. So just reach out to me. Wonderful. I will have Christine's contact links in the description. Christine, thank you so much for having this conversation. Thank and you. thank you for the work that you're doing. It's so important. Thank you. Right back at you. Thank you for watching the Love Covered Life podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and comment with your thoughts and opinions and check the description box for the links to my free community where I share lots of resources, my pay what you can community where we do classes and challenges together, my TikTok, Instagram, my clips channel and lovecoveredlife.com where I share my paintings. Thank you so much for your support.